so let's talk about Matthew one. Um, so it groups it into Matthew. He 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 lists the the names and then he mentions that there are fourteen in each. So he like groups them. Um, can you talk about why the writer Matthew is doing this? Like, what do you think the writer was trying to convey here? Okay. So, um, let me, let me go back to Matthew. He's, he okay. is the son of Alphaeus and possibly related to James, who was, uh, another disciple of Jesus. He's definitely, uh, Jewish. He's writing to a Jewish audience. He is a tax collector by trade. He is a person that thinks in numbers. <laughs> he, uh, he is obviously a very, very bright person. He, he appeals to written and uh, probably not just oral sources. So when you see genealogies that are 14, 14 and 14, there's 40 ancestors of Jesus that are mentioned. When you see that large number of them, this means that author is going back to written sources. So the question is, what are those written sources? They, genealogies were recorded as official documents. And so they were kept in, uh, even in the temple as part of that archive. But when Herod comes on the scene, you know, like in 40, 35 to 1 BC, he's an Edumean. He he's by he's a descendant of Esau. And he's like, well, I don't want these genealogical records to be there. I look like, you know, I'm out of favor. I'm not a descendant of Jacob and this whole patrilineal line. So he has a lot of those records burned. Okay, now what is Matthew going to use? He, it's thought that he uses, um, Luke says he uses eyewitness accounts, but Matthew is going back to, to there's a historian, Jewish historian named Eusebius. And he says, that there are families like in Bethlehem area that kept private records of, you know, the, they, they were uh, blood relatives of Jesus and they want to record for posterity that they were related to Jesus. And so Matthew's writing, I don't know, maybe 50, AD. So he's, he's going back to what are called the Despasini uh, tradition. This is these people that these are people that are related to Jesus. They kept their own family records. It'd be like, you know, you putting your will in a safe. They, they sh wanted to show that Jesus was a descendant of David. And they were a very well-respected group. So it's thought that Matthew is using these Despasini records. And he starts his, the genealogy has a literary structure. And I'll say this for your audience. There was a great book that I read uh, by David Dorsey. It's called The Literary Structure of Old Testament. And he tells you how to look for these like literary nuance to things. And so this genealogy is presented as, you know, like uh, Matthew 1, 1 says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, who was a, um, the son of, of uh, Abraham, who was the son of David. And then the very end of his genealogy he repeats that phrase. And so this, this is kind of an, an inclusio. This is telling you he's going to start with a beginning marker and then he's going to 
reiterate that at the very end. And that's what he does. So the 14, 14, 14 generations, obviously this is a, mm -hmm. um, this uh, is a multiple of the sacred number seven. And so what uh, Matthew does is he is selective about what people he's going to include. He, he omits four people that we know are present in Old Testament, but he does this to conform the genealogy to these repeated 14, 14, 14 generations. And in this way, he, the unit number one is from Abraham down to the time of the king. So this is patriarchs down to the time of King David. So that's unit one. That's a whole period of history. Abraham is coming coming in at like, he's born at 2166. He dies at about 1990. And so then by the time of David, which is the end of this first 14 generations, you're talking about, about David who was, who was, um, you know, born around or, um, uh, I think it was 1041, but he, he, he is the king from uh, 1011 to 971. And so there's a lot of years in there. It's a patriarchal to the time of the kings. And then unit two, which is this other uh, history of Israel, it's the time of the kings to the time of the exile. So he's hitting it again harder. You know, he's saying David is the first king. And then Matthew traces the kings of Israel down to the time of the last one, which is King uh, Jeconiah, who's also called uh, Jehoiakim. He's taken into exile. So all of that second unit is the royal line of kings. Hmm. The third unit of 14 generations is the time of the kings to the time of the birth, uh, I mean, the time of the exile, through the post-exile, all that second temple period to the birth of Jesus. And so that is like the exile. They start coming back. They're taken into captivity, 538. And now we're having the birth of Jesus around 3 or 2 BC. And so that unit that third unit of 14 generations um is how he's setting it up and his ending marker is jesus the messiah the son of david the son of abraham so he's definitely driving home matthew is to his jewish audience that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of Old Testament history from the time of the patriarchs. He is fulfilling. He is like fulfilling history. He's fulfilling the covenant promises to Abraham and David. And those covenants were, you know, uh, you know, Abraham's was back in Genesis, um, uh, Oh, like um, 15, Genesis um, uh, 17, Genesis 22. And then David's covenants that I will make your, well, Abraham's were, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And so, of course, Abraham's going, I don't even have a son. How could this be true? But by God's providence, sovereignty, and really his grace, he makes that happen. With David, he says in 1 Samuel, oh, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 7, he's saying that's the Davidic covenant. The Lord would establish his kingdom forever and his mm -hmm. throne forever. So now you're seeing Matthew is saying to his audience, you Jews should see Jesus as the uh, prophetic Messiah. Hmm. He's the one that's promised. All of Israel's history has been leading up to him. 
And he is the inheritor of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. So that's what he is saying in his genealogy. Um, mm. Anyway. Yeah, that's really cool. Pretty cool. All right. Yeah. And so the interesting thing about genealogy, genealogy is it, it mentions a number of women. Could you briefly talk about why yeah. you think Matthew was including the women in here? Um, well, he includes five women. And they have this aura of something that's improper, uh, but they are righteous women. He includes, first of all, Tamar. This is the time of Judah. Judah uh, and Tamar are, that's his daughter-in-law. And the line is going to pass from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and then through this daughter-in-law. Tamar was first married to Ur. He was wicked. God killed him. Then she she was um, Jake. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Judah gave him his second son. That was Onan, and he spilled the seed. He did not give her the children that sh that she was due. He did not pass on the line. God killed him. And so Judah is like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to give her the third son I have, Sheila. You know, he might die too. And so she takes it on herself to really humble herself as a prostitute. And J Judah sleeps with her. And, you know, the story, it, it ends up, he says, you were more righteous than I was to you. By his own admittance, he calls her righteous. And so the line, there's this little segmented genealogy instead of a long linear list of names. There's this brief segmented genealogy where you see the two sons of Tamar. It's Perez and uh, Zerah. And the lineage goes through Perez, the one that had the little scarlet thread. And um, so it's, it's really uh, noticeable that Matthew even includes the two sons instead of just the one. So then we have another woman. That would be um, Rahab, the harlot of Jericho. That is coming uh, at a time in history when the Israelites coming into the promised land and they come by way of Moab and they uh, come up from the east side of the Dead Sea. They come to Jericho and uh, Joshua sends out the spies and uh, she hides them. Uh, in her house against the wall of Jericho. She is, I mean, some, some scholars' commentaries are soft on her. They just say, well, she's an innkeeper. But it's clear from the biblical text, she was a harlot, a, uh, not a cultic har harlot, but uh, she slept with other men. And so, but she is called by, uh, in the Hebrew family of faith, she's called, she's said to be righteous because she hid the spies. The other thing she does is she sees this army of Israelites coming and she says, I believe in the God of Israel, not in the pagan gods of, of here, here. I believe in the God of Israel. And so she hides the spies under flax and lets them go the next day and deliberately lies to the other people that ask her, well, where did they go? And she says, you know, they've already left. And so eventually Matthew's genealogy tells us that she marries a, one of the spies named Salmon. 
and she comes in as an ancestress of the Messiah with that kind of background through her faith. So it's, you can change your whole trajectory of your whole life by coming to Christ and, and mm -hmm. doing righteous things. Yeah. The third person we see is uh, Ruth, and we've talked about her. She marries Boaz. She becomes the great, great grandmother of King David. So their children are Obed, Jesse, and uh, Jesse's son, David. Um, then we have the very interesting inclusion of what Matthew calls Uriah's wife. You see the, see the real point he's making? She's not David's wife. She was Uriah's wife. But this is a miraculous story. So, so good. Um, David takes her uh, in some kind of sexual exploitation. Some scholars say it's adultery. I don't see it's that. He is the the, he's the one that's doing all the action in this story. He sees her. He sees her from a place of advantage, like, you know, almost like a, he's, he's at home from war. He sees her in the courtyard in a personal space of her home. He sees her. He takes her. He, and has sexual relations with her. And then uh, she, she holds him accountable for the pregnancy and says, um, he, he takes the low road. He tries to get Uriah home so he'll sleep with her. Then ultimately he has Joab put Uriah in a place where he'll be killed in battle. They know not to go close to the enemy wall, but that's where he puts him. He deliberately has him murdered. And so now she has a child that child was a son and it dies so david has murdered her husband if you read the story very carefully you see that bathsheba is from the tribe of judah she's her grandfather is one of david's counselors court counselors this is why she and uriah who's in the military are living very close to the palace her grandfather is this court counselor. And through a whole lot of other narrative information, you find that Ahithophel, her grandfather, commits suicide. This is a person that has had tremendous insults in her life. And yet she rises above that. And when David is on his deathbed, her name means daughter of the oath. And she says, David, you promised me by an oath that my son Solomon would be your successor. And so she holds him to that promise. And she, you know, die, David dies maybe shortly thereafter. Solomon comes to the throne. And you see this beautiful story of how he pulls up a chair for her in the palace. And she becomes like a revered queen mother. And she overcomes all that tragedy in her life. And, uh, and yet Matthew is telling his audience, it was Uriah's wife. And so she, just like Ruth, has been married twice. Then you finally have Mary. She's the fifth person that Matthew includes. Uh, virginal conception. But there was this aura again of that there was things that were improper. Um, she's betrothed to Joseph at this point, but she's with child. And she, um, you know, when David was talking to the Pharisees, I think it was in John 8, he says, well, we are the children of Abraham and we're not illegitimate. And so the inference is that, Jesus, you were an illegitimate child. And so Matthew is clearing up all this uh, by the things he includes. Mary says, let this be unto me. Um, 
the virgin conception, all this talk that's going to take place in mm -hmm. Bethlehem in um, Nazareth and maybe in Bethlehem. I, I, I let this be to me. So she, as a virgin through the Holy spirit, she conceives Jesus, who is her firstborn child. She, he opens the womb. And, uh, then of course, um, the text is very clear that after he's born, that Joseph and Mary have sexual relations. They have at least uh, um, four sons and two daughters, two or, two or more daughters, um, because it's the sisters, it's always sisters in plural, Jesus' sisters. And uh, so they have this family and they settle. Uh, they went to Bethlehem for the census. Uh, but then they go back and raise their family in Nazareth. And so uh, Matthew includes them, not the huge matriarchs that you expect, but these more subtle women where there was this aura of impropriety. But each of those women is definitely, uh, uh, you know, said to be innocent. They were righteous women women of faith hmm. so it's really remarkable yeah 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 that's that so fascinating that's really awesome all right um you, you kind of covered the the whole covenant idea with, with mm -hmm. matthew's genealogy did anything else you want to add there um i don't think so i um okay. i think um you just see that in this whole list of names it's like x is the father of y and x is the father yeah. of y but what what's true in matthew's genealogy is that he includes um both he include includes some leveret sons just like um uh, boaz and ruth have obed he is considered the biological son of boaz but the legal heir of ruth's first husband malon and so, uh, so it's tracing not just strictly father, son, father, son. Also, Matthew is saying Jesus is coming not just as the Messiah for the Jews. He's coming also. These women were Gentiles, or at least some of them were. Rahab, maybe Tamar, definitely Ruth. These are Gentilic ancestors ancestresses of jesus and so this is his statement on jesus the messiah is going to be for the jews and the gentiles and this is what was always true i always think of it like a, a pointer like a telescoping pointer when you see it real short you think it's just mm -hmm. for jews but if you follow it and you extend it out you see that it includes, it's always included Gentiles, even back to the time of Abraham, when resident aliens or foreigners were brought into his household, they were circumcised. They were foreigners. They were not Jewish and they were part of his covenant family. Hmm. So yeah, that's, uh, awesome. I guess that's what I would say. Yeah. A little bit more about how sure, Matthew, awesome. okay. I have a lot of respect for Matthew. He's yeah. so, uh, I don't know if y'all have seen the chosen series, but he's probably yeah, have... just as nerdy as, as they <laughs> sort of portray him. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so, um, uh, we have Luke to talk about. I was hoping you would talk about and little cool. comparisons there. Do you have time for that? Sure. Okay. Awesome. So, 